Okay, this is the second part of the discussion um, on descriptive writing. Um, at the end of the last lecture, I asked you to um, take Normandy Beachhead and using your Mastering Essay Elements to look through and kind of um, try to figure out the moves that Ernie Powell was using in his um, essay that he wrote on the um, American um, invasion at Normandy Beach. Um, and so the first part of this particular um, screencast, we're going to talk about the moves that Ernie Powell makes in um, Normandy Beachhead. Let's take a look at Normandy Beachhead really quick. I'm going to read through it very quickly and then we'll get down to kind of breaking it down into its parts. So in the preceding column, we told about the D-Day wreckage among our machines of war that were expended in taking one of the Normandy beaches. But there is another and more human litter. So he starts by saying, we've talked about the machines, but now there's another litter that he wants to draw our attention to, litter being trash. It extends in a thin little line, just like a high water mark for miles along the beach. This is the strong personal gear, gear that will never be needed again of those who fought and died to give us our entrance into Europe. Here in a jumbled row for mile on mile are soldiers' packs. Here are socks and shoe polish, sewing kits, diaries, Bibles, and hand grenades. Here are the latest letters from home with the address on each one neatly razored out. One of the security precautions in force before the boys embarked. Here are toothbrushes and razors and snapshots of families back home staring up at you from the sand. Here are pocketbooks, metal mirrors, extra trousers, and bloody abandoned shoes. Here are broken handled shovels and portable radios smashed almost beyond recognition and mine detectors twisted and ruined. Here are torn pistol belts and canvas water buckets, first aid kits, and jumbled heaps of life belts. I picked up a pocket Bible with a soldier's name in it and put it in my jacket. I carried it half a mile or so and then put it back down on the beach. I don't know why I picked it up or why I put it back down. Soldiers carry strange things ashore with them. In every invasion, you'll find at least one soldier hitting the beach at each hour with a banjo slung over his shoulder. The most ironic piece of equipment marking our beach. This beat of first despair is a tennis racket that some soldier had brought along. It lies lonesomely on the sand, clamped in its rack, not a string broken. Two of the most dominant items in the beach refuse are cigarettes and writing paper. Each soldier was issued a carton of cigarettes just before he started. Today, these cartons, by the thousand, water-soaked and spilled out, mark the line of our first savage blow. Writing paper and airmail envelopes come second. The boys had intended to do a lot of writing in France, letters that would have filled those blank, abandoned pages. Always, there are dogs in every invasion. There's a dog still on the beach today, still pitifully looking for his master. He stays at the water's edge near a boat that lies twisted and half sunk at the water line. He barks appealingly to every soldier who approaches, trots eagerly along with him for a few feet, and then, sensing himself unwanted in all this haste, runs back to wait in vain for his own people at his own empty boat. Over and around this long, thin line of personal anguish, fresh men today are rushing vast supplies to keep our armies pushing on into France. Other squads of men pick amidst supplies to keep, um, I'm sorry, pick, pick amidst the wreckage to salvage ammunition and equipment that are still usable. Men worked and slept on the beach for days before the last D-Day victim was taken away for burial. I stepped over the form of one youngster whom I thought dead, but when I looked down, I saw he was only sleeping. He was very young and very tired. He lay on one elbow, his hand suspended in the air about six inches from the ground, and in the palm of his hand, he held a large, smooth rock. I stood and looked at him a long time. He seemed in his sleep to hold that rock lovingly as though it were his last link with a vanishing world. I have no idea at all why he went to sleep with the rock in his hand or what kept him from dropping it once he was asleep. It was just one of those little things without explanation that a person remembers for a long time. 
the strong, swirling tides of the Normandy coastline shift the contours of the sandy beach as they move in and out. They carry soldiers' bodies out to sea, and later they return them. They cover the corpses of heroes with sand, and then, in their whims, they uncover them. As I plowed out over the wet sand of the beach, I walked around what seemed to be a couple of pieces of driftwood sticking out of the sand, but they weren't driftwood. They were a soldier's two feet. He was completely covered by the shifting sands except for his feet. The toes of his GI shoes pointed toward the land he had come so far to see and which he had saw so briefly. Let's take a look at these seven common moves that Powell is using here in his um, essay. Let me make this a little bit bigger. Sorry. Oops. Just move this over. There we go. Okay, so let's start with the so what factor um, because every paper we talked about having to have that unique take on a subject that makes it um, connect to our readers. So there's no clear thesis statement. He doesn't tell us specifically his interpretation. Instead, because he his purpose is so rich, he leaves it up to us to fill in the blanks. The words tragic, heroic, absurd, perhaps even disgusting, flicker through our minds, though no single word is quite equal to what we feel. Powell avoids these and other reaction words. We talked about that in style. Preferring instead to allow us to walk the beach with him, bearing witness just as he did. In the beginning, he attaches it to other works in print. So he starts within the preceding column. Um, Powell was a, um, a writer, a, um, a reporter, a journalist, and so he had previously written um, other pieces, and this is particularly uh, another piece in that sequence. But even if you hadn't read the earlier column, he adds a bit of mystery um, with that first line, that, that, that startling statement, but there or here, I think is actually what he says, another and more human litter. So instead of those machines that he talked about, he wants to focus on something that's more human. Um, and we can take that, that's his generalization, we can take that as it's litter garbage that's left behind or the humans themselves are the litter that are that is on the beach. Um, most of the time generalizations are kind of bad. They can be errors if you're not careful but if you follow them with rich details like Pyle does it's actually a very effective tool. In the ending he ends with a zinger um, that climactic image calculated to make the reader feel. So he travels through this wreckage as he's seeing it on the beach. He talks about that more human litter um, and he's talking about the, the individual objects that are left on the beach or left behind. Um, and then we actually find a human litter. Um, this phrase takes on a new meaning. It's not, no longer just the litter left behind, but these human beings themselves are also the litter. The point is, of, the, of this, is that this invasion had a tremendous human cost, casualty, high casualty, and nothing could convey that cost more dramatically than that last image that he uses of the soldier buried on the beach um, he'd come so far to see the land, and he only saw it briefly. Two of the most fundamental rules for descriptive writing have to do with quality of details. Don't include things. We talked about that. Things have to mean. And don't just tell us. Show us through your description. So he uses these ordinary objects, letters, cigarettes, banjos, and they would be unexceptional if we found them at our house. However, here on this beach where they don't belong, left behind these people who are, are likely no longer alive, they become so much more important than just inanimate objects. They become suddenly objects that mean, okay? These are emblems of lives that are, that are over before they even begun. He doesn't tell us how to react. He's very like a scientist as he's moving around, along. He is ex examining them and reporting them back in a very clinical way. Um, he doesn't use uh, descriptive terminology. Sometimes, uh, sometimes he runs through a list 
uh, of items, and then sometimes he examines each one in close detail and reports back more detail. So that generic tennis racket, but this particular tennis racket that's lying lonesomely on the sand, clamped in its rack, not a string broken, not just generic photographs, but snapshots of family staring up at you from the sand. It's more powerful. It packs a more powerful punch, and it's designed to make us feel because they are things that mean. The organization is narrative. We follow the writer as he's walking along the beach, one object, then another, then another, reporting as he, as he goes along. But there's more. He's plotting. He's holding back information, okay? He's got that tiny piles of things here and there building up to the moment that he releases the, the greatest um, object or the one that's going to have the greatest impact. Um, and each one is more moving than the one before leading up to that last one. In style, the series of the dog, um, these are, this is the word, the word choices that you're using. The dog, uh, this is a, um, embedded, it has this sentence about the dog that's kind of lost its master and it's looking around. Um, it's quite, um, constructed very neatly for for various reasons. He uses parallel verbs. He barks appealingly. He trots eagerly. Um, and these series of parallel verbs there, there's an embedded phrase within there, sensing himself unwanted in all this haste, that embedded phrase. And he uses lots of details or lots of thick description. Um, and then again, with the palm of his hand, he held the large, smooth rock. Um, the normal order to put the rock at the end, because that's the word that he wants to emphasize. Pay particular attention to endings of sentences. Sentences should end with something strong. Here are socks and shoe polish, sewing kits, diaries, Bibles, and hand grenades. He saves hand grenades for last because it's a more powerful punch. You've got socks. You've got shoe polish, sewing kits. These things are not dangerous. He puts that dangerous object, that last powerful object, the can grenade that can literally blow you up and did blow up um, other human people. I mean, human people, obviously. Um, he saves that for last. Would it not be different if he had arranged it in any other order? It probably wouldn't pack as much punch. He puts even tiny details together. He puts diaries next to Bibles, Bibles next to hand grenades. All these choices are very deliberate. Um, this sentence is a cumulative sentence. Cumulative sentence is like a freight train. The main and essential clause are first, like an engine, and they, they're followed by a string of modifying phrases or clauses that trail behind that um, essential clause. It lies lonesomely on the sand, clamped in its rack, not a string broken. Any or all of those phrases could be detached and the main clause still would make sense. However, it's it, it, it becomes a more powerful statement because of the choice that he makes. In voice and style, he injects himself. I picked up, I carried, I stepped, I looked, I saw, making it very clear from the beginning that we're getting this personal first-person point of view. He expresses his state of mind. I don't know why. I have no idea why. He's not afraid to express himself there. He makes judgments, calling things strange, ironic, savage. And he even uses sentence fragments in a couple of places um, to establish a conversational tone like he was not just reporting, he's having a conversation. And each one of these moves helps establish his persona and they cause us to imagine the writer as a person, not just this reporter or an observer. Um, describing personality in an essay is always subjective to the, each reader, always debatable. Um, one plausible description of the person that we perceive in this essay, however, is that he is sensitive and sad. He's tough, obviously. He's seen a lot, um, he's, but he's tired of seeing what he's witnessing on this beat. Most of these sentences would seem natural in ordinary conversation, but he clips a lot of them because he has no words to waste. He's economical. There's another more human litter.
Soldiers carry strange things ashore with them. I stood and looked at him a long time. This brevity creates a matter-of-fact tone. I don't have time. I've got to get through and share all these items with you. And they're plain.